All right. Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. I know that there still will be some folks um, lingering in as we go, um, but want to be mindful of everyone's time. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Katie Miller. I'm uh, this year's president of EWHC, and I am also an attorney at Hall Render, Killian, Heath, and Lyman. Um, we are really excited to have everyone here and for this great presentation today. Um, as we get started, I want you to know that we're busily planning for 2021. Um, as with everything else, you know, plans are up in the air. Um, we're, we're hoping to be able to start doing some in-person small gatherings in the next couple months, um, but do expect that the first few events of ours will be on this virtual platform, which has served us pretty well throughout this pandemic so far. So, so we're looking forward to it. And we've got a lot of great stuff in the works. Um, as always, to start off, we wanna thank um, not only our members, but also our sponsors. Um, I'm gonna run through them real quick. If you are, of course, at any time, if you're interested in, in being a part of EWHC or being a sponsor, feel free to reach out to me, to um, any, any one of our board members or um, our, through our email address at ewhc.org. Um, for 2020, um, our sponsors are Ascension and IU Health Plans at the Platinum Level, Gold, or BSA Life Structures and Creed DeVault, Silver, American Structure Point, Core Planning Strategies, Fairbanks, Four Point Design, Gregory and Appel, Hall Render, IU Executive Education, TAP, Bronze, Drury Simmons, Fornum, F.A. Wilhelm, IDEO Incorporated, and Kat Sapper Miller. Um, we're thankful to all of you um, and especially for sticking with us through this pandemic. It's been a lifesaver. Um, we want to say a, a special big thanks to today's sponsors, BSA Life Structures and Navigate. We're lucky enough that our sponsor today is also our speaker. So um, we will get to tag team our um, sponsor talk and our speaker introduction. So I'm going to go ahead and kick it over to Jamie Raymond. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Jamie Raymond with Four Point Design. I'm this year's um, program chair for Executive Women in Healthcare, and it's my pleasure to introduce two, um, two um, professionals with BSA Life Structures. First is Andrea Sponsor. She is the Director of Lean Strategy and Change Management at BSA. She began her lean journey 10 years ago and was immediately immersed in the philosophy of improving what we do every day and eliminating ways to create value. Since then, her passion has been teaching the technical side and people side of change to others, promoting a more inclusive and efficient delivery of design. And Terry Joy is a senior healthcare operations planner at BSA Life Structures. As an operational planner with years of experience as a registered nurse, Terry helps healthcare teams develop new workflows and processes that improve efficiency, safety, utilize best practice, and focus on patient and family-centered care. Focusing on this, these tasks gives clinicians more time to focus on patient care needs and do the work they were meant to do. Um, so I'm happy to um, hand this over to Andrea to do um, an, introduce, an introduction first of BSA and then start the speaker presentation. So I'm gonna stop sharing Andrea. Great, thank you for having us uh, here today. And the goal of our uh, presentation that we have is really kind of talking about the healthcare disruptors that are here to stay and um, embracing change. Um, first though, as a sponsor of this event, we want to um, talk a little bit about BSA. And actually, computer was frozen there for a minute. Um, you can see our faces, but here's also a, a face to a name for Terry and I as we kind of walk you through this presentation. Um, but BSA Life Structures has been in, in business in Indianapolis for over 45 years. Uh, we have 200 plus employees. 74% uh, of our work is in the healing market. And now we have uh, stretched our reach to six studios nationwide. Our mission at BSA Life Structures is we create inspired solutions that improve lives. And it's something that we have um, you know, banners hanging and, and signs posted in each of our studios, but something that we truly embrace as designers and planners and implementers of our um, 
of our designs for each and every one of our, our clients. Our three main areas of focus uh, for design is healing, um, which includes the healthcare and, and well-being markets, uh, learning, um, specifically in higher education, and our discovery markets. So part of um, who BSA is at its core is uh, we're purposeful. You know, we, we pride ourselves on being experts in creating those inspired solutions in healing, learning, and discovery environments. Um, and really part of our name is being a life structure. And that just transitioned on its own without me hitting something. So sorry about that. <laughs> um, you know, we also take pride in being partners, um, creating lasting relationships with our clients and the communities that we serve to deliver success and deliver value, and that we change lives. It's something that we really um, take seriously in our work. And I'll just, I'll just let it go <laughs> from there. So now beginning our, our presentation, and hopefully it doesn't do that for the rest of the presentation, um, I'll, I'll turn it over to Deary, Terry Joy to kick us off. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for um, having us. We're excited to be here. On the first part of this presentation, I'm going to take us through some definitions of disruption and what is a disruptor. So if you Google what is a disruptor, if you're not sure what that is, it's a person or a thing that interrupts an event or activity, can be negative, can be positive. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna break it down a little further than that into some terms um, and try to put some time frames around that. Kind of our current environment is we are, keep asking ourselves, when is this gonna be over? When is the pandemic going to be over? How are we going to do things in the future? So I wanted to just kind of talk about the definition. And the first thing that we'll start with is a global disruptor. So a global disruptor is a very large disruption that affects many people. Two, or, two years or more, I tried to put a time frame with it so that it can seem a little more tangible. Examples of this um, is kind of some of the mergers be, that you've seen from some of the tech companies with some of the healthcare companies. Multiple healthcare systems have merged together. Other, other global disruptors in the healthcare industry would be um, care for performance. So you're paid if you have good outcomes. That was a big disruptor. Obamacare was another example. And I think at the bottom, as we go through this, I tried to think of a leader in a healthcare organization, kind of what they're thinking as these disruptions occur. As they watch the news this morning, Jamie listened to an IBJ report this morning, kind of as you listen to all of this information, how does this affect day to day? And how does it affect my people? How does it affect the people I'm responsible for and the budget? So you see that on the slide as I go through definitions. So you can go to the next slide, Andrew. So an operational disruptor can be long-term as well. Um, and you can have, as we go through this, you can have more than one disruptor at a time. Um, but an operational disruptor is typically long-term, anywhere from three months to two years. And I would say that's what our current COVID pandemic is. Other events that were of that magnitude on a national scale could have been 9-11. That took several years to um, clean up and reform. And then there were several um, different healthcare issues that came out of that event. Hurricane Katrina could be another operational disruptor to healthcare systems. And in New Orleans, that resulted in um, one of the major hospitals closing. Charity Hospital actually closed. So that was a large impact to that community. Next slide. A situational disruptor can be anywhere from one to nine days, 90 days. This can be more specific to a healthcare institution. Um, it can be targeted to a number of pieces of care delivery steps, affect maybe two to four departments, doesn't really last um, longer than a three month period. Um, as far as affecting your operations and really how does that entwine with the healthcare um, departments. Examples of this could be like the Boston bombing or the Boston Marathon, um, death of a leader. You see worldwide when the death of leaders, um, it's, it kind of puts people in limbo. 
um, a presidential election we just had. That's going to be a situational disruptor for all of us for the next several for the next couple months. As far as is payment going to change in healthcare? How is this looking for our hospitals? And then once again, how does this affect my day to day care delivery because because of implementation? Okay. And then you have human or emotional disruptor, disruptors. This can be an acute situation. Uh, it could last minutes. It could last up to two days to get everyone to calm down and kind of regroup after this happens. Certainly an example of this could be that you have, let's say that your IT systems go down in the entire hospital. That happens in minutes, but that's going to affect operations for several days once the IT system comes back up. Can also think of if there's a significant personal conflict with leaders or even with um, people who are working together, and that affects coworkers. And so, really, how do we keep our emotions kind of in check? Um, but but it does happen. So that's another form, and that's probably the shortest term uh, disruptor. So what can a leader use to engage and participate with a disruptor? This is a question that we're asked a lot. And I think just the most basic answer is that a systematic approach and standardized work to how you deal with conflict and change. Doesn't mean the system's the same. It doesn't mean the steps are the same all the time because you're gonna apply it, but you do at least need to have you know, anywhere from two to five core steps that when you have a problem or a disruption, it's the same process starting so that you can organize yourself and you can have everyone take a pause and then move forward with the solution. So we're going to talk a lot about a systematic approach and standardized work. And I think Andrea is going to take us through the next part of the slides. That really begins with um, who you are as a leader and being a leader and what that means to be a leader. So being a leader by definition is, is someone or something that's ahead of others in the race or competition, you know, a powerful person who's going to control or, or influence what other people do. But I think when it comes to being a leader within an organization, it's really someone who guides other people. We want to be that guide and not a person of, of power. So um, I, when I do presentations, I like quotes, quotes inspire me, but this one in particular in, in understanding that true leadership lies in guiding others to success, ensuring that everyone's performing at their best, doing their work, they're pledged to do and, and doing it well. So we want to be that leader, leader that guides, that really takes people on their journey um, through change, through disruptors and um, being in control of, of the situation and, and creating true leadership. So to do that, though, we need to kind of start with understanding the people who we are leading and, and we're guiding. And I think part of that is understanding how people react to change, be it that short term emotional disruptor or that very you know, long term operational or global disruptor. Um, so we have people on this change curve that will be innovators. They're the people who are willing to take risks. They're the influencers in change. Um, and then we move into the early adopters, the people who are actively looking for that solution. Um, and then moving to the early majority where they're comfortable being part of the herd. You know, once those in, er, innovators and early adopters have kind of gotten on board, they feel a bit more comfortable. Um, and then there's the late majority and the laggards, you know, the people who are waiting for it to pass or waiting for something to happen or just avoiding change altogether because they they think that it doesn't apply to them. And I think understanding where your people are on that change curve will help you then guide them through that change and understand what kind of change management approach you need to apply to them. You know, those innovators and early adopters, they're they're going to be your your leaders your people who are advocating for the change. And this is probably most applicable to that long-term change. You know, those emotional short-term disruptors, you don't need to bring a coalition or, you know, group of people together to help you advocate for this. Um, but when they are those kind of longer-term changes, this is something that's truly going to impact their work, not just today in the short-term, 
but for you know months and years to come. So we need to kind of gather together our innovators and early adopters that will help us on this journey. But we need to also understand that there is a chasm that we're going to need to get over. And it's going to take those innovators and early adopters to help us get over that chasm, to get to that early majority that really help us start to tip the curve of really implementing um, true change within our organization. Uh, again, identifying where your groups are on this curve will help you apply your approach to them. And that's kind of the first step in, in that systematic approach and standardized work is understanding who your people are that you're approaching and how you need to approach them. When we're introducing change, I think also understanding as people how we react to change is something beneficial. You know, when we're in that initial, the world is changing, there's a lot of shock and denial and we need to create alignment. We need to bring our groups together um, and ensure that we're all on the same page. Then we move into frustration, and that's where, as a leader, we should maximize communication. You know, we understand you're frustrated. We understand things are changing, um, but here's what we're working on. Here's how we're we're trying to um, get through this change. You know, make sure that you're you're maximizing your communication with them. And then when everyone gets into that valley of despair, and we all do, um, we're depressed, we're frustrated. We need to spark motivation. We need to get people to kind of get out of that valley and move back into um, business as usual. And part of that is experimenting, you know, developing that capability to actually do um, what we're asking them to do with this change um, and creating that acceptance and sharing knowledge so that we can move into true integration. And this is now the new way that we're going to be working. So I think um, what we can kind of take from technology is how people react to um, technology changing on us. And this is both in our personal lives with, you know, the introduction of a new iPhone, but also as technology um, changes within the healthcare world as well. So there is this disruptor, um, you know, this innovation trigger that happens. And I think people kind of fall into these moments of um, expectation, or disillusionment and before we get to that early majority and late majority where we kind of move back into the plateau of productivity. Agreed. And I think that I think when technology is the disruptor initially, I think you see that peak. Everyone's very excited that it's going to make the job easier. It's going to make things easier. And I think initially it doesn't make things easier because you're learning and you're doing at the same time. And so just kind of guiding people through that and then also helping everyone on the team understand that there are several steps and really understanding what the people that are the end users are doing and really how it affects how they deliver care within a healthcare setting, I think is important because sometimes it can add work. Technology can add work. And then what that's gonna do is it's going to cause them not to want to adopt change. So it's helpful to just kind of have a good view overhead overall, not just say, oh, this is gonna be great. It's gonna fix everything because then you're always gonna hear that person say, but it didn't fix this for me because of X, Y, Z. So just understanding the excitement and the end result globally, but also understanding the application and operational nature that it can be hard initially. I think also understanding that lack of excitement. So when, you know, when we are introducing new things, technology change, et cetera, um, going back to that slide a couple of slides ago and understanding that um, change isn't always exciting to everyone. And, and so again, just kind of stating that importance of um, understanding where people are on that curve can help us all work through it. And part of that then kind of leads into the next topic that we have here is being that leader and a teacher. So when we are that leader and teacher, we get to know our audience. We understand where they are on that change curve. Um, we're understanding just how radical this change is for them. You know, is it incremental? And so we don't need to apply a lot of change management to it. Or is this really upending the way that they do their work every day? And this is something that we're going to have to um, apply some effort and apply some education to, to really get people understanding it and, and on board with it. Um, we need to then tailor our education to meet them at their obstacle. So where is their roadblock? Where do we 
picture them not wanting to take this change to the next level and meeting them there and helping them get through it. Um, I, I think if if anyone has kids, been around kids, um, you know, you get that why, 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 because I said so. And a lot of times um, we even use that a bit as leaders and teachers within our organizations. Um, but we need to start with the why, you know, not just skip over it and not say because it's the right thing to do. We need to really get them to deeply understand the why. What is the business case for this change? Why has this disruptor um, prompted this new way of doing business that that we're explaining to you. Um, truly get them to understand that business case and then create that need for change on an individual level. So now we have told you why as an organization we need to change. This is what it means for you. And that's part of building that desire in them to address how it's going to impact them. Um, teach them how to use those tools in, in thought and practice as you're introducing it. And then check back to see what's really working or not. I, I know for me personally, um, that's something that I don't always remember to do. You know, you put together an education plan, you teach it to them, you think that everyone understands it and they're off and running, but you forget to put in those 30 day, 60 day, 90 day checks to see, is it really working the way that we truly intended it to? I think as you develop that education plan too, um, remember that as adult learners, we need to hear something at least three times before we remember it. And sometimes it's about seeing, hearing, and doing that really makes it stick. You know, we retain approximately 10% of what we see, 30 to 40% of what we see and hear, but 90% of what we see, hear, and do. So putting that into your education plan can help you really make sure that what you're teaching them is going to stick. And I think also, again, meeting the people that you're teaching where they um, where they are and where they prefer to be educated is important, too. So as you're putting that plan together, understand if they're visual learners, if they're auditory learners or if they're kinesthetic learners. So that as you um, teach them about the change, you're putting together videos, you're giving them pre-reads or post-reads, um, you're making sure that your lecture has um, group discussions involved, stories and examples that they can relate to, and that you're taking time to do some breakout sessions to actually simulate the change that's happening, whether that's through scenario testing or working with the technology that you're introducing, um, something that's going to make what they've seen and what they've heard be more tangible because now they're doing it. Now they're working in the program, now they're running through the steps um, and they're taking notes and they're walking through it. And by doing all three of those things, then when they're actually put into the situation where they, they have to do it and where patient care is at stake, um, they're, they're fully knowledgeable and fully capable of being able to do it. So I think one of the questions that will kind of lead us into the next part with TJ is, why is it easier for some leaders and difficult for others? So I think that understanding, we're going to talk about empathy and we're going to talk about adding that to systemic approach and adding that to standardized work. And really, all three of those things must be present um, for you to be successful with your team. Next slide. So where do we start? Uh, you might be thinking, you know, what do I do if I have a large problem? And I think we're going to talk about some short-term and long-term uh, tactics that might be a place for you to start and use. Next slide. So standardized work, and, and when I say standardized work, it doesn't mean that you have to do it the same way every time, but it does mean that there are, like I said earlier, two to five steps or maybe 10 steps that you do every time, because then what happens is your team starts to understand how you're problem solving. And then that's a form of teaching because you're showing them how to problem solve. So you want to think about, you want to think about what's most effective, what's the safest way, but you also want to reduce variation. My teams, when I worked at Eskenazi, uh, when I had the privilege of having the surgical department, which is a very complex department, if there was a problem, when someone would come to me, it got to a, a kind of a, 
a point where they knew what the questions were going to be. Tell me, tell me about the problem. Tell me what can we do to make it better right now? And then let's talk about uh, how we can move forward. So I think standardized work and standardized approach is very important. Next slide. I think just to add to that, TJ, before we move on, I mean, part of that too is about reducing variation. Um, and in that education piece too of, I don't have to think about it. I don't have to think about what questions to ask. I don't think of, have to think about how I'm going to approach it. Um, and also we're not wasting time because as TJ had said in her example, everyone knows what we're going to ask. So they can come prepared with those answers and we can move into the problem solving phase quicker than the um, investigation phase if they're unclear of you know all of the reasons why the issue is having or uh, issue is happening or the disruptor is happening. Yeah, great point, Andrea. So where do we start short term? I find that being present with your team um, and over communicating with them, you can never communicate with people enough. You probably feel like that's a lot of time that you spend doing that is very valuable to end users and to your team. And I also think being present with them. Sometimes I didn't have anything to tell them that was new. And sometimes what I had to tell them wasn't pleasant. But they did know that I was going to be caring and empathetic, but I was also going to be respectfully honest to make sure that expectations were understood and they knew where we were going. So I think communication with the team, whether it's good news, bad news, or no news, just letting them know that it's that standard approach. We're going to huddle every day at 7 o'clock in the morning, and we're going to talk about what is going on. Maybe nothing, but it may be something big. I think coaching, I try to think of leadership as coaching because you see the potential in people and you, you want to coach your direct reports, but then you also have to flip over to a different role with your leadership team. So for me, that was with the C-suite and with the chief nursing officer, and I had to debrief them on what was going on. Sometimes, again, it's not always pleasant but they do have to be aware. So you have to be aware of what the actual problem is so that you can address some basic needs. You can go to the next slide. And, and I bring this up, this is a, this is a healthcare um, clinical kind of nursing. This is what we're taught in nursing school is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. A lot of times we forget about these. And if, this, if your team is hungry or they're tired or they don't feel safe, they don't have the resources they need to do their job, they are most likely not going to be excited about if you're going to introduce that change or one more thing for them to do. If, if, you, if they feel like the physiological needs have been met, safety needs have been met, and then empathy starts to come in as you go up. Um, they they want to know that you care about them, that you care about their family. Um, you don't have to have an overly personal relationship, but you do have to engage somewhat on a personal level because you want them to know you're human. You want to share some things. It's okay as a leader. I think this is the thing I've learned over the last two years at BSA. Um, it's okay to be vulnerable. I, I went from being a director of four departments for 20 years to being an operational planner that I'd never done before. And um, just someone, Andrea has been a really good uh, person to have, and just someone being that resource and saying, you know what, you're doing a good job and it's okay and we all make mistakes. Here's what I would do the next time. So I think just kind of working through some of this hierarchy of need on the human level also allows people to kind of come along with you and start to develop trust. And I do think that affects whether or not you can implement change. So we've, we've touched on this with a few of our other slides, but um, a model that I learned when I began my change management journey was the ADCAR model from ProSci. If you want to look them up, they have 30 plus years in change management research and, and education. Um, but as an internal implementer of change, I, um, I, I struggled with that, you know, with how to do it appropriately and, and with the most impact. And it seemed so obvious after I went through this training um, that I was jumping straight to knowledge. I was teaching people about the change and hoping for the best that they would implement it when I left the room. 
Um, and the light bulb went off when it was like I was skipping the first two steps. I was skipping that awareness of the need for change. You know, why are we implementing this new tool? Why are we changing the way that we deliver our work? It's worked really well for the last, you know, umpteen decades. Um, people need to understand that business case first. If you can't tell them the why behind it, it's really hard for them to embrace it and get on board with it and implement it. The next stage then is that desire message. So I need to create personal desire in people to support and participate in the change. If I can't answer what's in it for them, then again, it's that moment where they've opted out, either physically opted out or mentally opted out in your education and training session. Those two messages need to be supported and delivered by leadership. That awareness message needs to be delivered by the C-suite leadership. You know, as an organization, this is why we're changing. That desire message needs to be supported and delivered by their direct manager or leader, because when they have the questions of what's in it for me, they need to have the comfort level to go to that person and ask them and have that person be able to give them an appropriate answer. So those are two things that I think um, are, are overlooked and sometimes missed when we're implementing change. Once we have that, once we have supported them as people, then we can start to build knowledge of how to change. We can start to put together our education and training plan, which will then lead to creating ability, giving them the skills and the behavior that are required to actually participate and successfully implement the change. And then lastly, what I touched on a few slides ago was that reinforcement. And that's so important to be able to sustain the change because not everything that we roll out is going to be perfect on day one. There are going to be some things that need some continuous improvement applied to them. And if we don't have those moments of check-in and those moments of reinforcement, it will be really easy for people to say, this isn't working, this doesn't help, and I'm just going to go back to the old way of doing it because at least it's familiar to me. Um, but maybe it's just a small tweak or a small change or an adjustment in technology or whatever it might be. Um, but that check-in will help us identify that and improve it and make this, the, the change that we're trying to implement more sustainable. And I think I, I really liked what Andrea said about the reinforcement, because I think from a long term perspective, the reinforcement and education and transparency, I know those are some buzzwords, but those things are important. If we say we're going to be transparent, then the plan needs to be posted somewhere where everybody can see what the plan is and understand their expectations. And so that if they get lost, they can say, oh, this is why sometimes rationale helps. I think it helps quite a bit, and sometimes I would post that, um, and sometimes I do that with the design teams. In my current role, from it's kind of revisiting what those uh, guiding principles are. What are they going to be doing in this environment? Why do we need to keep doing that? So I think the reinforcement sometimes is you have to say it multiple times, like we said earlier, but it's to continue to check in educate and build the team. And you wanna make sure if somebody comes to you with a problem that you acknowledge it. If you can't do anything about it because there are other constraints, it's okay, but it's still important to acknowledge it and thank them for their support so that that door remains open so that they can continue um, to provide information. So I really think the reinforcement piece of it um, is probably one of the bigger things for long-term is that you keep doing that cycle repeatedly over and over. Just because you implemented a system doesn't mean that you leave it. Uh, because exactly what Andrea said is what happens. People are like, oh, they're not. They only wanted to do it for a short period of time. I'm going to go back to my way of doing things until someone tells me I can't. So again, just kind of checking in and reviewing, I think, in that reinforcement is really important. I think that building that that's also in the education plan. Um, what you're changing may not be changing, but learn and improve on how you're educating people. Um, and that even moves on to um, potentially an onboarding manual or a new employee manual that you're putting together too. If someone is coming um, new to healthcare or from another um, system, what do we need to teach them? What do we need to tell them to understand our way. Um, I think that also is true within uh, the architectural and, and design world too, because 
every architect, every designer puts together a set of documents, but we all do it just a little bit differently. And I think when we're building that plan and giving people the why behind it, it helps them kind of adapt and, and respond to our standardized work um, rather than just bringing their old familiar habits along with them. So we put together a, a few books here too. Um, if we've kind of piqued your interest or curiosity in any of these topics, um, these are a few that TJ and I have read. Um, the five dysfunctions of a team is great if you have a dysfunctional team <laughs> and you want to kind of learn some steps and, and order of, of things that you need to build to be um, high performing and high functioning. Um, Strength Finder, if you have um, not heard of this, this is I, I would say a little bit of a personality uh, assessment, but it goes beyond that and a little deeper to kind of who you are at your core and what your strengths are. Um, understanding as your entire team, be it leadership, um, education and training team, where people's strengths are. Um, some people might be better at communication and empathy, and so you can put them in those roles. Um, some people may be better at responsibility and focus and kind of developing that plan and ensuring that it's um, it, it meets expectations. And I think understanding where people are as people um, helps you adapt your plan uh, a little bit better. And then a few of these other books are just about kind of the tools and techniques and things of positive psychology and, and building a, a true team of teams that can um, really help make change. And if books aren't your thing and you want something that's a little shorter. There are also some blogs um, to reach out to for tips on facilitation. So how do I start the conversation? How do I build a high performing team? And I'm sure we've all at some point in our, our lives participated in a silly icebreaker of what our favorite cereal is or, you know, where were you born? Um, but there is actually some um, science behind that. And that's part of that foundation of building trust as a team. If we are getting to know one another, um, it's not our deepest, darkest secrets, but it's creating that trust and creating that empathy that we need to be successful as a team and to um, work through the disruptors. So I think so it's, a, <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Um, go, go ahead, TJ. <laughs> going to say, I think we're close to the end. Uh, we're getting close to the end and we wanted to pose a question um, for the question answer session is, what is a disruptor that you've experienced and how did you work through it? Um, and then if you have questions for us, we're also uh, willing to share examples with any of our projects that we're working on or any of our past projects. Hey, Andrea Perry, thank you very much. They, um, it looks like we've got a couple questions in the chat box um, so far. I'm not sure if how we have this set up, if anyone is able to uh, like unmute themselves and actually talk. So I think any questions will have to go through the chat or the question and answer function, unless Jamie tells me differently. But I think that's how it works as we have it set up. Um, but one of the questions, it was, you suggested to understanding who your staff is, early adopters, laggers, et cetera. Do you have any particular tools or suggestions to gather this information? Um, some past experience and suggestions from other change management professionals are put that curve up there and just ask them about change in their personal lives. Where would they put themselves on the curve? And they said that most likely, uh, or what we've experienced is that people are more likely to kind of self-assess better than what we would assess them as. Um, I, I would put myself honestly in more of an early majority um, because I'm aware that change doesn't come easily or naturally to me. I need a, a little bit of of help and guidance up front, which is ironic as a change leader, I know. But I think a lot of people do have that self-awareness. So popping that up on a screen or sending it out in a survey and having people um, do that can help you kind of do that initial information gathering. Katie, I just wanted to add, if people want to talk, they just need to raise their hand and I can see it on the screen and I can allow them to talk. So I just have to click and <laughs> let them talk. 
Jamie has all the power. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So hopefully everyone heard that. If you if you do have a comment or question that you want to ask live, just at the bottom of your screen, um, click the raise your hand button, which I don't see on mine, but I'm assuming because I'm a presenter, I don't have to have that. Um, yeah. Okay, so another question on here was about the asking the, to speak to the Criminal Justice Center transition planning project. Okay, you want to start, Andrew? In, like any particular question? Because that's a, that's um, a big guy. How you kind of apply these um, concepts to that transition project. Right, well, I will say um, our team is just dipping our toes into the water on this one. So um, the current phase that we're in for the project is gap analysis. So understanding what work they've done to date with their design teams um, as, you know, how far have you taken your developing a, a future state process? What current policies, procedures do you have in place? And kind of gathering all of that current state information because um, to make a change, you need to understand what you're changing from. So that is the point that we're in. And then in the change management approach to it, um, that's the part where we'll decide, is this going to be an incremental change to them? Because we're really not changing the policy procedure, we're just updating the address. Or have, you know, is this going to be a radical change? Because now that they're consolidating all of these campuses together, we really need to change the way that we're doing X. Um, so that information gathering phase is, is where we're at right now. I also think that one of the things about um, how, we, how we're applying standardized work for this team, um, the Criminal Justice Center, um, it, it's a project where uh, there's consolidation between the Marion County Sheriff's Department, the courts, and the um, jail system. So you have a lot of um, different people, a lot of different communication techniques, a lot of different responses that we will get if we hand the same thing to the Sheriff's Department and then we hand uh, the same thing to the Courts Department, we will get a different response. How we address that, though, is through our standard work. We, we develop our standard work, our standard approach, um, and it kind of takes some of that um, emotionalism out of it. Um, and if you aren't comfortable dealing with people who are very direct, um, it, it's just to be aware of that and to have some scripted sentences that you use so that you can keep yourself from escalating as well. Because some of the conversations in these groups um, can get a little bit challenging. Um, in the hospital, it's a similar way. I worked uh, with surgeons most of my life and they're very direct people. Um, and that's hard to respond to sometimes. Um, so just having that standard work of how you respond and what your answers are and not being afraid to kind of repeat that and re-educate as you need to, I think is something that um, we have learned um, in the first couple months with this team. And I think they've responded in a positive manner uh, to that approach. All right, any other questions or comments from the group? All right, well, with that said, um, thank you very much. This was a lot of great information. We really appreciate you both, you both being with us. Um, I want everyone who's listening in to know that our next event will be on the impact of the election on healthcare. So no drama there whatsoever, just a <laughs> straight to the point presentation will be given on uh, December 2nd by uh, one of my colleagues who is a, a works in DC um, on the Hill. So she will be giving kind of her perspective on how the election is gonna affect healthcare in the future and kind of what you can see coming. Um, so hope you all can join us for that. And in the meantime, I hope everybody has a great week and a great Thanksgiving. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.